Okay, so um, I'm, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about how robots and computer gaming uh, how they can help restore the movement ability of people who have physical impairments, and I'll talk about the need, different approaches um, to doing this. Robot assisted therapy. I'll focus in on that. That's the main area I do, and then how how are we going to get full restoration? Yeah, and I have a disclosure, which is I have a financial interest in a company that um, sells the device that we made. It's an arm exoskeleton. But before that, I want to just uh, put this slide up and show you there's a lot of really cool things happening at UC Irvine in, in the area of um, human movement and rehabilitation. And things like interactive dance that could be used for rehab. This is the exoskeleton that's a commercial product. Frame computer interfaces, excellent work there. We have gate training robots, the computer gaming uh, major and center, and uh, the world's smallest three-axis accelerometer. We're one of the leading places for stem cell research with two of the first clinical trials for people with spinal cord injury came out of UC Irvine. And so there's really cool stuff in this area at UC Irvine. <clears throat> Okay, so what's the need, first of all? Um, so if you consider the number of people who have a neurologic-based physical impairment, um, so stroke is by far the largest population, so it's about 7 million people in the U.S. About 50% have long-term hemiparesis, that means weakness on one half of the body. And about 30% are unable to walk at six months. And then we have uh, people with cerebral palsy, um, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, so conservatively, you got about 2% of the population um, that has a physical impairment. And I'll show you this video. This is a, a volunteer for one of our s studies. And in this video, I'm asking her to touch her chin. Um, so, you can, so she had a stroke, and you can see she can move her arm. That's why it's called paresis, not paralysis. Uh, but she, won't, she can't touch her chin. That's as high as she can lift her arm. So we're, we're really focused on people who are severely impaired. And how, how do we get a person, um, enable a person like this to exercise intensively? Um, I want to point out to you that this field is like growing dramatically. It's growing exponential in terms of the number of papers and devices and startup companies. And a lot of what's pushing that is mainly the aging of the, of the um, population in developed countries. And so, um, yeah, so there, there's a, there's, it's a rapidly growing field. So traditionally, um, there's kind of three approaches to helping people with disability. And I put, these are the two most successful technologies in history for uh, people with disability. So one is the wheelchair. And this is, this is kind of the approach of assisting someone. So, um, and then um, secondly, you could replace a part. So like a prosthetic limb, here's a hip implant. And again, if you know someone who's had one of these, you know what a dramatic difference it can make in someone's life. Um, and then the third approach is actually retraining. Um, so you have an injury, and our brains have this remarkable ability to recover. And our, our brains are plastic, we can learn. And so there's, there's a huge field of trying to retrain people how to move. And now robotics is dramatically enhancing these three approaches. <clears throat> so in the assist realm, we've got now legged exoskeletons. There's two or three companies now that are selling devices that can um, you, you fasten to the outside of your legs. This one's out of a startup out of Berkeley. And uh, uh, you can start taking some steps. And uh, so, <clears throat> and then uh, for replacing, there was a real breakthrough in prosthetics recently. Actually, there's been a couple, but you get, did you guys see uh, Oscar Pistorius at the Olympics, the guy, guy running there? So that, that was pretty cool to see that. Um, this is work by Todd Kaiken um, at Northwestern University, and so there's kind of a holy grail in upper extremity prosthetics, which was how, how could you give someone control of multiple fingers, like in uh, Star Wars, like Luke's arm, right? How do you get that? And existing prosthetic uh, arms were just able to give you one or two degrees of freedom at a time using myoelectric uh, control, so putting electrodes on your muscles and measuring activity or maybe a cable that goes over your shoulder and you shrug your shoulder like this to open and close the hand. That's kind of one of the most popular, still one of the most popular. It's lightweight, it's reliable, you can feel stuff you're touching by the force you're exerting with your shoulders. So, um, Ty Kai came, uh, he took, uh, this volunteer uh, was a power man, he had grabbed a uh, hot power line and lost both of his arms that were burned. And so it's called a shoulder disarticulation amputee. 
So he, he has this um, pectoralis muscle here, which normally would be uh, attached to his upper arm, but it's, the upper arm isn't there, so it's just a muscle that's not doing anything anymore. Um, so what, what they did was they took the nerve that was normally going down into the arm, so there's a fragment of it you know, coming from the brain down. So that fragment, they di dissected it out and so, sewed it into bundles in the pe pectoralis muscle. Now a peripheral nerve like that will actually re -enervate. So after, I think, three to six months, it actually grows into the muscle. And uh, so now what happens when the guy says, when the guy says, hey, open my hand, what, what, what happens physically to him? Question for you guys. Yeah, so then, yeah, he says, open my hand, and, and a little bundle of pectoralis muscle contracts. Okay, and so you can see now they put electrodes over this. So they're using the muscle as a biological amplifier. They put electrodes, they can detect that, and then this gets processed and then actually causes the robot hand to open. What's that? No, you don't use the pectoralis for breathing, so. Yeah, you use it. What's that? Oh, do you normally use it for? Uh, this, pull, pull your arm in like this. And also, like if you're doing bench presses, this kind of thing. So. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, so it's really cool. So, um, so now they can get up, I think, up to six degrees of freedom on the arm here, and it's naturalistic. So he thinks, "Open my hand," and the and the hand opens. He, and very little retraining has to take place. Now, something that was really cool about this too was that uh, the sensory fibers in that nerve reinnervated the skin over the in the pectoralis. So, what now? So, if you touch his skin here, what would happen? What would he feel? Yeah, he'd feel it on his like missing hand. He feels it as if something's touching his hand. And so that, so now you could put an artificial sensor on the, out here on the hand, and then you process that. When he touches something, you process it, and then you put what's called a tactor, which is a little vibration device that could go over the muscle. So he would know when things are, you know, he's, he's, he'd feel it as if it's on his hand. So it's a, it was a real breakthrough in prosthetics. People still kind of don't like to wear them. Uh, they're, it's still really heavy. And so, uh, People, it's hot and heavy, and you have to put the electrodes on. So it, there's still limitations. There's to, but it's sort of the fundamental idea of giving more degrees of freedom is, has been it's been a breakthrough. And then the area I've worked in mainly is in um, robotic devices for retraining movement. And remember, we had this picture of the uh, occupational therapist helping the, the hand with his hand exercise. So we build exoskeletons um, that look like this. This is for Professor Jim Bobro. Um, Steve Spencer is a PhD student. I love the video because every time he turns up the speed of the robot, he smiles. So you can <laughs> see he's really confident in his programming and safety mechanisms here. So we don't do that to patients, but that kind of just shows you that. So he's just relaxed, and the robot's moving, moving here. Um, okay, so I'll tell you the story about that robot in a second. It's called Bones. All right, so why, why would we build robots like that? Well, um, there's use-dependent plasticity in almost all motor system injuries and diseases. That means if you just have a little bit left, you can make it better. Okay, if you have a little bit of movement control left, left, you can make it better. And sometimes people can make it a lot better. And I, I, I think you know, when you watch the Olympics, you understand that, right? You people, like, we're just mere mortals, and then you watch people who have trained intensively in what they can do, and it's incredible. Right, so rehab is really like that. You want it to be like Olympic training where you take someone with potential and do intensive training to get to this level of expertise where they maximize whatever they have left. So traditionally the way it's done is this one-on-one -on -one interaction with physical and occupational therapists, but that's really expensive. And so technology has the potential to allow more therapy with less supervision. Uh, importantly too, you never really knew what was happening in the therapy. You don't measure it, so it's very, it's very variable. Um, what patients are, are experiencing and the science is not well developed because you don't actually know kind of what's happening. So um, computer games and robots have wearable sensors have uh, ability to quantify and then potentially you can even give entirely new types of therapy which I won't talk about too much but just to give you one example there are electrical stimulation systems that help people after a stroke people will have trouble lifting up their toe when they're walking so they'll, they'll kind of drag their toe and so you can you can put an electrical stimulation system here on your on your muscles around here that'll help you lift your toe at the right time. 
And if it's called a foot drop stimulator. And if you do that and you wear that, well, of course, it helps you lift your toe and you walk. But if you wear that every day, when you take it off, you're actually better at lifting your toe. Okay, so that was therapy to the person. Did they go to the gym and work out? No, they just got it during their normal course of life, right? So by having a wearable device, you can actually make therapy <laughs> continuously available potentially. Okay. All right, so this field, as I mentioned, is growing uh, dramatically, exponentially here. This number of publications, a little survey I did in a review article in 2009. This is the company I work with, Hokama Sales Figures up to 2010. They sell a robotic gait training system. Our device is the yellow one, the Armio Spring. And um, so it's not a huge field yet, but we, I, I estimate there's about 1,000 robotic therapy devices out right now. Um, but if you look, in a big survey of 1,300 therapists, um, about 70% had used some sort of new technology, but only 2% had used robots. Okay, so up here they use these they different devices for the hand. And the foot drop stimulator is this one. Uh, they used the Wii. The Wii was very common, um, or one of the more common things. But only 2% had exposure to robots. So um, it's growing, but it's mainly the robots are in sort of major rehab hospitals now, not, not in the sort of the smaller uh, rehab facilities. All right, so now I'm going to just give you a quick glimpse of the state of the field. So uh, the robots, what do they do? How do you help someone recover movement? And the primary thing that robots have implemented so far is just assisting people in moving. And the rationale for that is it helps stretch out your soft tissue. It's just stretching. People have um, um, spasticity, which is hyperactive stretch reflexes. And if you stretch muscles, it actually can reduce spasticity, at least temporarily. Um, idea is that also, um, if I can't move, I'm not really getting the sensory input I need for my brain to reorganize. So the, there's this idea of heavy plasticity, which kind of is summarized as cells that fire together, uh, wire together. And the idea is that um, if I will a movement and I activate my muscle, then it's probably good, good if my limb actually moves and I get sensory feedback consistent with what my intent was, and that might help plasticity. And that's actually a scientific question that's still, it's difficult to answer this question if that's really what's happening in rehab, but, that, that, but that's one hypothesis. And then finally, it, it can motivate by increasing self-efficacy. Uh, by that I mean, a patient said, you know, if, if I can't do it once, why would I do it 100 times? So you can see the video of the person who couldn't touch their chin. So she's pretty, it would be very difficult for her to exercise, right? Because this is pretty discouraging. What can you do that's meaningful? And, but if she gets into a, one of these exoskeletons and then start, can start moving kind of meaningfully, it becomes much more motivating to exercise. At least by patient reports. We don't actually know if people take that home, do they exercise more or not. That study hasn't been done yet, but yeah. Uh, so would you expect any sort of uh, any type of plasticity to occur if people are just doing passive movement to the robot? It, 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 if you mean passive, or they're passive? Would they're passive, they're not yeah. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. The term passive in therapy, it means the person's passive. So you're, you're just, oh. okay. In robotics, the term passive means the robot doesn't have motors on it. So there's this big confusion on ice <laughs> between what we're talking about. But you mean if the patient is just like um, not doing, just like you're, you're not just intending. hanging out and yeah. the thing. No, that actually, we know there's been several good studies now yeah. showing that. That can help with spasticity and keeping your joints supple, but it doesn't help with sort of neuro, neuro recovery. Yeah, and, I, and I'll get into that in the talk. Um, because an unintended a result of assisting people with robots is it makes them more passive. And so, <laughs> so we have to, you know, you have to overcome that in the way you design the robot. Yeah. I guess wondering, is there a potential damage to the tissue by the constant excitation or whatever? And is there a place where you can, one would recognize the pattern and then develop sort of an intelligence system that rather than relying on the Repeated excitation, but rather the system will take over and anticipate what the person is doing. And, uh, what was it on? Yeah, I mean, oh, so when you, you're putting here on, right. on electrical stimulation, right, right. yeah, um, there can be issues there with the interface, but the electrodes are designed to be non, um, yeah, to not, not irritate you as much as possible. Um, and the stimulation pulses as well. Um, and then I think uh, your second part of your question was like, kind of, 
sometimes you might just want the device to do it for you and you not have to work or like if you, if you recognize a certain pattern of that individual uh -huh. like an intelligence like a little chip or whatever yeah you know, programmed to override or, or vice versa yeah I mean, I mean the idea of like personalizing the device to the patient is right. like a huge area now and uh, I mean, a good physical therapist or occupational therapist, that's a large part about what they're about is understanding your particular needs and then doing what's appropriate for you. Yeah, so, so hey, Greg's, uh, this uh, um, fellow here is working on a project like that also, trying to understand how you can sort of optimally challenge people to recover. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna just tell you three studies. So the, uh, that kind of give you a, overview of the state of the field. So the first is the VA MIT MANA study. And this was funded by the uh, Veterans Administration in their continuum, continuum of medical care, their hospitals. And they used a robot called MIT MANUS. It came out of MIT, and it's this black thing here. And it can assist you in moving your arm on the tabletop. Very simple design. Very, very I think a good, elegant, simple design. And uh, it was, you can see it was published in New England Journal of Medicine, which is the highest possible standard. So in rehab, I think only three, there have only been three studies published in New England Journal of Medicine, and two of them used robotic devices. So that kind of gives you an indication that the robots, because they're doing something more quantifiable, lead potentially to better science. So they had 127 chronic stroke patients. They got 12 weeks of therapy. And over here, you can kind of see the results. Um, so this is the change in a scale called the Fuglemeyer assessment, which is a standard clinical assessment. It goes from zero to 66. Zero would mean your arm's completely paralyzed. 66 means you can move normally. And the way it's scored is a, a trained evaluator will give you um, 33 test movements. Lift your arm like this and keep your elbow straight. And, sh and she'll score at zero, meaning you can't do it. One, meaning you did it imperfectly. And two, meaning you did it perfectly. So there's real kind of precise definitions of what those mean. And then you sum up all the scores. So a clinically meaningful change is thought to be maybe five points, something like that. Um, so they had three groups in the study. One just got their usual care. You can see their score did not improve. The second got robot therapy uh, three times. It was three times a week. And you can see that at the end of the long-term follow-up here, they were up about five points. And then the third group got intense conventional therapy and that was a um, physical or occupational therapist right next to them saying go, 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 do it, another one, do it, do it, come on, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, and trying to get the same number of repetitions as they could get with the computer game on the robot. Okay, and you can see that was, that was as good here and then it kind of tailed off. This difference, who knows, I, no one really knows why, why that was different. So, you know, who, who would have thought it, but uh, the robot actually is about as good as you can get with a therapist right by your side doing, doing, telling you to go as hard as you can. And uh, these are small changes, so we would all like to see these be bigger, but they're significant and there's something to build on. Now, um, let's see, I was going to say something else. Oh, the cost, yeah. Uh, so this robot's pretty pricey. It's about $100,000 for just the, this part. And they had a vertical <laughs> module and then a wrist arm module. So they did a big cost study, and it turned out that the cost of these two things was about the same. But that's largely in part because the robots are really expensive right now. And probably if you make robots that are less expensive or you sell more of them, then it'll become more cost, cost effective. Okay, second study. This is a gait orthosis called the locomot that was designed to take people who were paralyzed, couldn't walk at all, um, and get them up and start moving their legs. Okay, so it just kind of drives your legs through a walking pattern. And um, some colleagues applied it to people with stroke who were ambulatory. That means they could walk but very slowly. So it's kind of not applying the device to the person it was like intended for, right? Uh, so then they measured self-selective walking velocity and your fastest velocity. And this is pre-normalized uh, to zero here. So this is change. And then after, I think, I think it was two months of training. I, I don't remember. And then I had a follow-up. And you can see uh, the control group here got trained by a therapist. And the control group went up this amount, so 0.15 meters per second faster, which is kind of not that much, but it's still measurable. And then they sustained it 
This is the robot. So they, they got better in the robot, but they didn't do as well as when a therapist was training them. And so this is kind of a good example of, well, the robot didn't work as well as the therapist, and then you have to ask why. You know? And the thinking here is that um, this robot was just moving, it would just keep moving even if you fell asleep in the robot. And so, right? and so they actually measured energy consumption when people were walking in this versus when they were being assisted by a therapist using oxygen uh, measurements. And uh, they found that you could, when you're being helped by a therapist, you were consuming about twice as much oxygen as you were when you are in the robot. So indeed, it somehow was encouraging you to be passive, even though you don't necessarily consciously think I'm going to become passive. So obvious potential solution is computer gaming, where you can measure the forces the person's generating here in real time and somehow have your game like uh, um, encourage um, active motion by the patient. And, that, and that's what that company is doing. Okay, and then a device that we developed here is called uh, T-Rex. We took a mobile arm support developed by Tariq Roman at the AI DuPont Institute uh, for Children in Delaware. And uh, it was for kids to put on their wheelchair and they could help feed. It would, it's relieve um, gravity using rubber bands. And we scaled it up, put sensors on it, put a hand grip that could measure real small amounts of grip force, and then developed a series of computer games. Um, you guys can see it out afterwards, it's over in the room over here, but um, uh, so now someone who, like in that video, who can barely lift their arm and can't use their hand, all of a sudden if you put the arm in this, they can move their arm better because it's kind of like it's floating in a pool. Uh, and they, if they can only just move their hand a little bit, they can now, we detect that and they can um, control an avatar representing their hand to pick up and release things. And so people find this really motivating. So someone who can never really pick up, like come over and pick up this cup, now in the virtual world they can pick up a cup and put it down. So we compared it to, this would be the normal type of exercise a patient would get when they would go home. Just tabletop exercises. Um, we had to train the patients for a week how to use the device, and then a week how to do these. We had two groups. And after that first week of training, then they trained for another seven weeks, and they only needed four minutes of therapist supervision. So the therapist would just, hey, welcome, get you set up, get you going. The control group would get set up on this and get going on that. And we found, this is the Fuglemeyer, again, about a four-point change. Red is for the robot group. And they, they, they actually, at the long-term follow-up, six months, had recovered more than the control group. So here is an example where the, the device was actually a little bit better than that kind of now, when you ask people, you know, which one do they like, uh, pretty strongly, it's not 100%, but it's 90% prefer the game-based therapy. And they like it because of the gaming, and they like it because they get a, a score, and so people are, some people are competitive and like that. And then they like it because um, of the self-efficacy is improved, where this quote, if I can't do it once, why would I do it 100 times? So they're able to actually do meaningful things, and that makes it more encouraging to try to, try to do things. Okay, so that's the state of the field. So there's, you know, there is certainly plasticity, and um, you can get more therapy with less supervision. The machines are still pretty expensive, though. Uh, you can get better quantification of therapy and its outcomes, and it's unclear right now how do you get the optimal therapy. And one thing we know we need to look out for is the patient slacking. Okay. All right. So where where does it go from here? So we're going to go towards um, full restoration. And so three kind of ways that we can do that is um, tailoring the therapy to the patient, better device design, and then combination therapies. So let's pull this up real quick. Okay, so I'll just give you a little five minute overview of some of these things. Okay, first this is work with Steve Kramer and so right now we kind of say, hey, you had a stroke, okay, you're a stroke patient. And there's no distinction about where the stroke was or how big it was. And um, with Maria Lynn Malo, who's a postdoctoral fellow here, we did a transcranial magnetic stimulation to where you, you put current through here, it creates a magnetic field that induces a current in the brain, which causes the neuron to activate, and then you get a little twitch. If you're doing it over the right part of the brain, you can get a little twitch in the muscle down in the hand, for example. And so you can see, uh, you measure the size of the twitch that's resulting. 
and then we plotted it versus how much did they benefit from therapy. And if they had low baseline motor evoked potentials, they benefited more from the therapy. So basically the idea is like you could do some measurements of people before they do the therapy and you could tell someone like, hey, you've got a lot of room to improve. I, I, I know, I'm pretty confident you're gonna get a lot better. Well, as another person you could say like, eh, you know, you might get better, but it looks like maybe you wanna try a different therapy because this one, the way you're set up, it's probably not gonna help you that much. So we think we can probably at least double results by getting more specific. And, and it's the idea of like, if you have cancer, you get different treatments for, you know, depending on the type of cancer that you have. Okay, for better devices, um, I'm gonna give you three things. Preventing slacking, reducing complexity, and increasing intensity. So slacking, let me run these videos. This is another exoskeleton we built. And in, in the top one here, it's assisting her in reaching out and grabbing items and then putting them in a sharpening cord. This one, the robot's off, and you can see how much she's struggling. She can't get up to reach the object. So what we found that was counter, you know, we didn't expect is when we took the standard robotic controller out of, you know, a, a robotics control text and used it to like assist a person, your brain would subconsciously let the controller take over. And you, it's actually, you can mathematically model the algorithm that your brain's using uh, to slack. Now slacking is a negative term for it. The po what's the positive term for it? Or, or what would be a positive term for it? I'm just gonna <laughs> Relaxing. Yeah, uh, yeah, those are good. Uh, energy minimization. Like it's good for you to you know not use use energy, right? It's a valuable resource. So you don't want to do things inefficiently. You want to do them efficiently. So you would guess that our bodies have in them lots of mechanisms to help us make our movements more efficient, right? It'd be very important from an evolutionary point of view to be able to to do that. And so, um, indeed, we found that, um, and so it's, what was the answer? So I'm not going to explain this graph, but uh, the answer was we had to make the robot be a little bit of a slacker. And just by, just by allowing a little bit of error, uh, only a centimeter or two of error in some of these tasks they're doing, then you can see this is kind of the amount of effort that they were doing versus the level of their impairment. And you can see, and then here's, uh, actually, this is the amount of, um, effort the robot's doing. The X's are with, with, with the conventional controller, and then the zeros are with the anti slacking controller. And so the robot's doing much less work here when it just allows the patient to do a little bit of error. So you just need a little error to help motivate you, is kind of the story there. Is the slacking by the robot uh, static? Uh, no, it's basically, the idea of the slacking is uh, <clears throat> when the robot senses that it's doing the same thing over and over again, it, t it tries to do it with a little less force each time. Okay. That's, that's kind of the, and that's how your brain does it too. We actually use sort of the same algorithm your brain uses. And which brings up an interesting question is, how do you know when you're doing the same thing over and over again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there was recently a paper actually in PLOS Computational Biology that took our, the slacking idea um, this, that we had this equation that represented, and they applied it on a single neuron basis and showed that it optimized the network, uh, made the network much more efficient to do it on each, on each neuron. So it's an interesting question, like, is it happening at the neuron level? It could be consistent with a, a, accommodation. It's kind of a, a similar s s concept. Um, um, but, or, or, or is it sort of systems that are interacting in a certain way? You know, so the slacking things, I, I think it's fascinating. It probably is important too for you know athletics and things like that. Okay, so kind of the the uh, oh this this plot was just showing that when we used an anti-slacking controller, then people it was better than conventional therapy. So, the, so basically, um, so in all these types of devices, like people are now saying look, we need algorithms that automatically and judiciously set the challenge level, and that's what a good physical therapist or occupational therapist will do, and a good computer game will do, right? So you have levels, and you choose your level, and you level up. And it's the same sort of thing. These devices need to be able to sort of zoom in on what the right level is for the patient and sense that. And that's what Greg Zembrock was working on for his project with a, a simple hand uh, therapy device. All right. Next question, are, are more degrees of freedom better? So 
you know, we have this robot that we built to allow lots of degrees of freedom. So here's a guy uh, who had a stroke. He used to drive a motorcycle, and we have a game set up here where he's driving a motorcycle through Death Valley, and the robot's kind of helping him steer it. And you can see he's like really engaged by it. And so in therapy, there's this mantra, if you do more, more functional movements, then because of specificity of learning, you get better at what you train at, then it would be better to do functional training if you want to get better at function. And so we decided to test that, and we had people, um, trained with these kind of carnival games that were lots of degrees of freedom, anti-slacking, versus just tracking an app as sort of representation of each of your arm, one joint at a time. So they did this for four, four weeks, and then they did this for four weeks, and we compared, did they, which, during which period did they get better? And much to our surprise, uh, this is kind of a summary measurement, but during, they got better when they did these individual missions. So it's really counterintuitive. Not, it's borders on statistical significance, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, but that was fascinating to us. So this man, so again, physical therapy, rehabilitation therapy, it has this mantra, but it's really not been proven, and now you have a device that can kind of test it, so you can do, do, do science with it. Okay, um, so simple devices might, might be okay. Um, and then third, uh, increasing intensity, so this uh, therapist observed 312 therapy sessions and observed that the average number of repetitions were only 32 per session. So it's hard to get people to do a lot of repetitions. So how, how do we get people to do a lot? How do we get them to do it at home? In animal models, you need a, they, they, they have animals doing at least 600 repetitions per session to induce plasticity. So working with Dan Zondervan, this is one device we made. So here's the same, same video. And it just snaps onto your wheelchair and you can rock in it. And we were inspired by conversations with Don Schoengofer, who's the um, founder and president of Free Wheelchair Mission. And he, he developed a low-cost wheelchair that they've given out, I think 300,000 of them around the world, although the, the, the need is huge, around, it's like 300 million or something. Um, and he, he saw our sophisticated exoskeleton and he said, oh, that's so cool. You know, wish, could you take what you learned from that and apply it to something simpler that, you know, you, that, so people could have access to rehab therapy anywhere in the world? And so I, I saw a study in Belgium where they just had patients rock themselves in a rocking chair. And so you stay active, the patient stays active. Uh, also, it has resonance, so if you, if you push a little bit at the right time, then you get bigger and bigger motion. So it's kind of like robot assistance. Uh, it's not just a blind movement, because you have to rock at the right time. Like, it requires some coordination. Therapists like it because it's, it's a component of doing this, like reaching out to grab something, flexing your shoulder. And, uh, so we got pretty good results with that. Um, here's kind of the summary with eight patients. We did a study in Mexico City where they started off pretty impaired and gained here almost eight Kugelmar points and then sustained it in three months. So simpler technology might work. Now, in the US, we were giving this out to people, and they're like, ooh, it's really boring. We thought like rocking would be good enough, because rocking chairs, that's a valid market. People still buy them, right, and like them. Uh, in Mexico City, there was uh, Dan was just sitting and having a conversation while they were there, so that was good. But if you have to go home and use it, it's pretty boring. So now what we did was we put one on each side, uh, and put a, a tilt sensor, an accelerometer on it, and you can use it as a two-degree frame joystick now. And we're putting a hand grip sensor on it too. So right now you can do like a driving game. You rock to go through the, and then turn like this. So, and then another one that uh, Nitsan Friedman and Mark Bachman. This is what Greg's been working on. Um, so this is a glove that can measure different grips. So if I told you, hey, I want you to practice doing a key pinch grip, do that a thousand times in the next hour, right? No way, right? Or pencil grip, do that a thousand times. Pretty hard to get someone to do that. So Nitsan made this glove that, that has conductive fabric and you can sense when you're completing the right grip. And then we hooked it up to Guitar Hero, which is the third most popular video game franchise in history. And like the second one was developed by a UCI student, by the way. So um, Whiskey was pretty intimately involved. Um, and so people really like it. You listen to music and we can get about 1,500 grips per session, 9,000 grips over six, session, six sessions. And when we compared it to, um, this is conventional therapy with a therapist. This is the number of blocks you can pick up uh, in a minute. This is actually the change in that score. 
Um, so with the glove, you were able to pick up three more blocks in that minute, whereas the control therapy didn't really benefit anyone. So again, we, we were a little bit better than traditional therapy. And here people, you know, 11 of the 12 preferred this strongly. This person didn't like it because he couldn't quite make the grips. So we had a different device that he, pre he preferred a little bit more. Okay, and then lastly, um, like how do we get people home, like to full recovery, right? And that's gonna happen through regeneration. So two of the first uh, clinical trials of stem cell therapy came from Hans Kirstedt and then Aline Anderson and Brian Cummings. And so rehab, the types of devices I'm sharing are gonna be really important for that work because the stem, the stem cells will go in there and help you um, make, they'll, they'll have cells that will hopefully form new connections, but those connections have to be trained. And so you need intensive therapy, really intense therapy probably, and it has to be the right kind of therapy. So these devices are gonna be used to give that therapy. All right, so kind of where the field is, the most effective rehab technology will provide appropriate challenge. I think it can be made relatively simple and then uh, ultimately we're going to transform mobility by combining the technology with um, new therapeutics and stem cells. And we're at a great place for that. So, um, This is Vicki Chan, who's our research physical therapist, who's like the keeps our lab going and runs all, 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 recruits all these volunteers to do the therapy and she's been great. And then we get support from National Institute of Health, National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research, um, NIDR, National Institute of Disability Rehabilitation Research. I'm involved with a uh, rehabilitation robotic center that's a center at the Rehab Institute of Chicago. And the ICTS here supports us, and then all my collaborators. Um, all right, so that's that's it. Now, I did put, I have three slides on more personal about being a professor. Do you got, can I show you guys that stuff? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right, any questions first on the technical part? Yeah. If you were to like shock the muscle into contracting with the brain like send a signal, would the muscle just contract the phone? Say it again? If you were to shock a muscle into contracting with the brain send like a nerve signal? No, well if you shock the muscle here, then um, it'll contract and there's all types of sensors on the skin and then inside the muscle. And that and when you shock it you excite those sensors and they send action potentials, the electrical signal, up to the brain. So you, so you feel it, <laughs> right? And if it's too, too highly, if the current's too much, then you feel it hurts, right? So, yeah, so it doesn't cause, you, you can actually get sort of reflex reactions by shocking a person and then, and then get, get a reflex as well, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, how important is motivation? And like, do you ever consider giving them actual real rewards for doing better in these games? Yeah, no, I think motivation is uh, essential. It's a little bit blurred in our studies because we normally are, um, people are coming into our lab, there's a physical therapist sitting there with them, and they get a small stipend to complete the study. And so we're pretty much, like it's a pretty, but even then if they're doing two months of therapy, it can get boring, yeah. right? The stipend is not dependent on performance. Right? No, so we thought about doing that. I know there's some you know, uh, neuroimaging studies that look at the role of like increasing <laughs> you know, your stipend, right, <laughs> on how well you do, and things yeah. like that, right, expectation of reward. Uh, yeah, I think so, motivation is totally essential. Um, understand, so, uh, understanding how you design the environment to maximize motivation, uh, and also then understanding, I think, I guess, neurochemically, how motivation is facilitating plasticity, uh, beneficial plasticity, yeah. those are two really interesting questions. So, the, the connection between behavior to the sort of, neuromodulator level is really interesting. Yeah? I have a question on the uh, sustainability. Yeah. So these, any kind of therapy, I guess, uh, that will involve kind of be uh, related to the overall cost to, to justify whether you need a such device at home to actually uh, constantly engage the patient after the therapy session. Right. So, uh, I saw your data, it all shows about, tracks about Two weeks all the way to a couple months. Yeah. What about long term? Just anyway. like following up two, three years later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's harder to do, um, but it's necessary to do that. Yeah. I, I mean people haven't done studies where they give therapy for really long periods of time. Um, in our studies, if you usually we see people sort of, it's kind of like an exponential. It's a, probably a double exponential, but it. Uh, 
after about three to four weeks, people go up like this, and then they kind of have a flatter slope, and no one really runs that out. And then also, if you change the therapy, like say they're doing robot therapy up to here, and then you give them like a wee, would, would they go like that again or what? It's, it's unclear right now. But uh, yeah, that, those types of studies are more expensive, they're harder, it takes longer to get publications, so they, they have tended not to be done as much. <coughs> Okay. All right. So then, now I'm going to talk about being a professor. <laughs> uh, it's kind of small, but uh, yeah. So you guys be merciful to me. This is a little more personal. So, but I thought I'd share it with you, since you guys are you know doing research and getting involved. So why be a professor? I look back on some things I wrote a while ago about you know what I like about my job, and. Uh, Here's, two, here's three things I really like. So first, discovery. And so as a professor, I have a really excellent opportunity to uncover uh, or to, to contribute something useful that can help us people. Uh, or maybe beautiful. It can be beautiful. Although I don't know if our robots are beautiful. They're kind of cool to look at. But, or, or just fascinating. It could be just fascinating. Like the slacking thing. It's probably going to be useful, but I think I'm just fascinated by it too. Um, and what you have is our universe, it's like, it has this incredible structure to it, right? That science is slowly uncovering. We've only just barely begun, right? Especially, I think, in the neurosciences, I think it's just overwhelming. And so, um, and I get paid to do it. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's a great career if you are like that kind of thing, like in investigating and learning new things. And then second is um, freedom. So if you become a professor, um, you have an amazing amount of latitude on what you choose to study. Really, I can't think of another job like this, okay? Unless you're like Bill Gates or something, and then you know, you're independently wealthy, and you can do whatever you want. But you know, basically, we we have some constraints on what we can study, but it's pretty wide open. So you you can uh, so that freedom is really amazing. And then the third thing, another thing I really like it is about mentoring and. Our, our society used to be set up more that you, you had these apprentice uh, mentor relationships, especially for the trades, and that's kind of gone away. But I think still in a professor, especially the graduate student relationship, you still have that. And it's cool. You get to know someone really well, and um, you can teach them not only skills and knowledge, but like the perspective on like what to do when life, you know, things don't go well, <laughs> when things are hard and things like that. And so I really enjoy that aspect. Um, it's harder with undergrads because there's so many of you, uh, undergrads. So you guys are mostly undergrads, is that right? Uh, some are grad students and some are. The surfit students are all undergrads. Yeah, surfits are all undergrads. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. 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 So, but you know, if you can't get into a lab, well, you know, like you guys are doing, but um, but the mentoring thing can be cool. Okay. So then I said. You know, why not be a professor? <laughs> what are some of the difficult things about it? Because I think it's good, good to um, think about that. So <clears throat> one is it's, it's really easy to get discouraged. Uh, oh, it's not easy. It's just like natural. Or it's, you're going to get discouraged. So I just put some examples here. So, um, like, so I could spend hundreds of hours on a single paper, right? And then um, it could get rejected by a reviewer who looks at it for 15 minutes. And they might not even know what they're talking about. Or they just might have a bad day, or just be mean, right? And so there's a great video uh, on the internet, which is it's about reviewer number three, and it's this yeah, it's, Professor Krishmar knows what I'm talking about. So uh, yeah, it's really funny. Uh, it's from the movie. What movie is that from? I don't know because they show that same clip. Yeah, they put out Yeah, I many remember. different things to it. But it's, it's Hitler in his bunker getting bad news, yeah. and 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 they've dubbed over say it's like. It's news about his scientific review process, and it's always reviewer number three. So, um, and then uh, writing a grant is like playing slots, except the slot machine is um, takes like probably like two or three weeks to pull. A lot of really intense work, and then uh, then it takes like you don't it spins for about three to five months, and you don't get the results. <laughs> so, and it's about the same odds right now. Funding rates are down below ten percent. And so uh, it's you know that's hard, and then uh, I you know no matter how good I, mean, my, I usually get decent teaching reviews, but no matter how hard I try and how good like on average my reviews are, I always have some people who think I'm like terrible, and it's really it's really interesting to see that. And so it's just human nature. Uh, I think we're different people connect in different ways. So 
Um, but it's fun to juxtapose, juxtapose the, the comments next to each other sometimes. So. Um, and then many times your ideas don't play out. So even though I'm smart and the physical world is complex and probabilistic, okay? So you might have ideas and spend weeks or months and then you just didn't see it or it didn't work or there's too much noise or whatever. So that can be discouraging. So um, then a second thing uh, is like, I think there's a lot of pressure to become arrogant as a professor. I don't know if you guys noticed that in your faculty. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking about it, we're kind of like smart celebrities with substantial power and, and kind of aloof bosses. Like our bosses, our deans don't really interact with us directly that much, our chairs don't that much. You're kind of like running your own small business. And you're kind of like a celebrity, you know, because we, all the students, we can we control your destiny in some small sense. <laughs> that recommendation letter, you know, it's true, like, you know, I just, you know, a student asked for a recommendation, I got a call from the company, the student had done really well in my lab, so I like, said this is a great student, you're not going to be disappointed, they hired him on the basis of my phone conversation. You know, so there's a, a certain sense of responsibility or power, and there's a little bit of a celebrity part too, where the, you know, the, the published shape, or, you know, it could be in a magazine, there's the glove over there, things like that, so, on, on the ma magazine, so. And then, uh, so there's pressure, and then pressure to live with a narrow focus. So you can really get just absorbed, um, into um, becoming obsessed with just your research and your, your small domain. And I, I, it's kind of a joke, it's kind of a little sad, we joke with my friends, like you almost have to have obsessive compulsive disorder to be a, pres uh, a uh, professor, like, but not too severe, you <laughs> know, not too severe. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so you could get really into just like the, that narrow, narrow as. So to conclude, I put my, uh, you know, how to enjoy the good and not cave into the pressure of pressers. And so um, the first one I put up here uh, is persistence. Um, I actually, I wanted to say one more thing. Of the, you know, this is my list I made a few years back, but I would add one other thing to this, which is just getting over busy. It's like incredible how many demands there are on us. And with the budget cutbacks especially, I think there's increasing demands because we've a lot of, lost a lot of the staff and our TA support hasn't gone up as well. So it's just overwhelming. Um, I know like if I, you, you, you know, just to, you know, I went backpacking this weekend, came back and probably had 200 emails that took me five, you know, five hours to go through today. So, um, anyway, so that that's another thing. So, um, so how do you enjoy the good? So I think if you're considering a career in academia, persistence is like probably the most important quality you need to have, <laughs> and. That's because you're gonna get rejected. And like, there's all these famous stories about Nobel Prize winners like getting rejected for you know, their Nobel Prize winning work or whatever. And even like Sherwin Rowland, our Nobel Prize winner here, recently died. I mean, he, he encountered vicious opposition to his theory of, about ozone, the ozone there. So, um, you know, you're gonna get grant rejections, only 10% get funded, you're gonna get paper rejections, you just have to plug on, keep going. It's hard to get an academic job. You're gonna get a lot of rejections when you apply to be a professor. And so, just this quality of being able to persist is really important. And then the second here is I put prayer. And uh, so we just submitted a big, a huge grant application, right? And uh, it's like 150 pages, involves seven faculty and um, you know, we, after we submitted it, it went through, and it's like someone emailed and said, now we pray. You know, so it's, and uh, they kind of, I think facetiously, but there is a sense there. And I, I think what I mean by prayer is um, this kind of letting go and, and saying there's a, uh, if you take a step of faith that there's a sort of greater force at work that intends good in the universe. And I, and I was thinking about how to explain this to you guys. So I was thinking of the, what came to mind is the Lord of the Rings. And the, you know the scene where, um, uh, I think it's the second movie with the writers of Rohan, and it's like almost over, right? And um, Gandalf had said, you know, look for me at dawn on the third day or whatever. You guys know that scene? Yeah, you guys are like, what's he talking about? <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, it's just a great scene because the sun rises and Gandalf shows up, and then there's like all the writers, you know, this, this, those rebel writers of Rohan come and they, they're victorious. But that movie and that, those books have this sense that even though it's incredibly difficult, there's sort of this underlying, it's going to work out, uh, it's not going to be easy, but there's sort of this essence of good. So I think that's what I mean, mean by prayer there. And uh, 
letting go, getting perspective, especially that narrow focus part and the um, becoming discouraged. And then people, so just like having lots of good relationships and hopefully, you know, with your, you know, your students, your, your mentors and your friends and your lab mates, whatever, that's, that's like makes it rich. And then just having fun with it. I think is the most, is probably one of the most important things, like not taking it too seriously. So, all right. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. you.